Hi, everyone. I am Natalie. I am an engineer on the Garden Windows team. And I'm Matt, uh, engineer on the Garden Windows team. Uh, this is that team that we work with. Uh, most of them are still back home uh, in New York. Uh, but there they are with our old uh, team name bander there, Greenhouse. Uh, now we are two teams, Garden Windows, Bosch Windows, and a few other ancillary teams as well. So one of the things uh, we mentioned this morning was the .NET renaissance. And uh, what our team does is enable the .NET renaissance. What do we mean by that? Well, now that we have uh, .NET Core and CloudNative.NET with Steeltoe and DevOps becoming a thing in the Windows world, uh, we need a place to run all of that, right? And for Linux, that's great. We have a Linux story. Uh, you, can, you can push with the .NET Core build pack. You can uh, already have the Java experience with the Java build pack. It all works just fine. But what about Windows? What about Windows applications that are tightly coupled to the Windows operating system? So that's where we come in. So there are some applications that are just not suited to run in .NET Core. They need to run somewhere. App developers don't necessarily want to be operators. I personally don't want to write a Docker file or think about anything other than my application. Uh, Microsoft thinks developers want to think about Docker files, and that's OK. We'll let them focus on that, and we focus on the CF push experience. And that's what the Cloud Foundry application runtime brings. And so we have this world where both of these uh, exist in harmony. Right? You can push your Docker files, so you can push them to Kubernetes. That works fine. And you can also push them to the application runtime. So that's what Natalie and I work on. So our team is Garden Windows. Uh, we make containers on Windows. And we also maintain the rootFS that you will use uh, with Windows Server containers in Cloud Foundry. Uh, we contribute to the application lifecycle for Windows and .NET, so things like the HWC build pack and the build pack app lifecycle. And we are a source of Windows and some .NET domain expertise for the Cloud Foundry community. So what have we been working on since the last CF Summit? We are keeping up with the latest releases of Windows. We have been continuing our effort towards pragmatic parity that Matt and Sean Fan talked about this morning. And finally, we're working on enabling future platform features. So really quickly, uh, just a recap, if you're new to Windows workloads on Cloud Foundry, here are the components that we maintain. Uh, for context, we're showing the garden server. Uh, it calls out to different plugins to do different things. So we have the containerizer on Linux. That would be RunC, which is a binary that knows how to do things with containers. Um, on the Windows side, we have WinC, which also conforms to the OCI standard, so we fulfill the same API. Um, for networking, we have Wink Network. And um, for image management, we have group windows. So our components make use of the host compute service and the host network service, which are Windows services that let us do things with containers and their networks. So now Matt's going to talk about uh, how that's been changing with the different versions of Windows. Great. Thanks, Natalie. So we work pretty hard at keeping up to date with Windows Server releases. Uh, turns out it's not super simple. Uh, so right now, we are targeting uh, the Windows semi-annual channel. Uh, Windows Server 2016 is a long-term support release. This means is uh, when it's released, it has uh, four years plus of support. However, it comes with the caveat. There are no new features or improvements brought to Server 2016. So you may have noticed, if you've deployed the Windows stack, we called it Windows 2016. But that's a bit of a misnomer. Uh, it's really Windows 1709, 1803, and 2019. We'll get more into that later. Uh, the six-month uh, release cycle of the semi-annual channel is great, because that previous bullet, no new features or improvements, well, that doesn't apply to the semi-annual channel. However, uh, the downside of the semi-annual channel is it's only supported for two years. 
But you cannot think about any of these problems when you're running Cloud Foundry, right? Because you see if push to your app, you have a droplet, and we can just take care of everything below the application. So that's really where the value of the application runtime comes in. We are uh, always testing against the next release. So we did verify compatibility with Windows Server 2019 uh, before Server 2019 disappeared from the internet this week. Uh, so it will be coming out uh, soon. Uh, as of CF deployment 3.5.0, we introduced support for Windows 18.03. Windows 18.03 has a smaller root FS, networking improvements. We're now using what's known as HNS ACLs instead of Windows Firewall to enforce the NetOut policy. NetOut policy is all the rules from your application security groups. Uh, the good thing about this, this is a security feature, is that the container admin can no longer override your network policy. Uh, previously in uh, 1709, if you ever got to container admin, hopefully you couldn't, uh, you would actually be able to break out of our net out rules. So 1803 is a huge improvement. And finally, moving to 1803 enables new platform features, which we'll talk about shortly. So pragmatic parity is another thing that we think about uh, in, the, in the Windows world. What do we mean by pragmatic parity? Well, this is sort of the diagram that we show to people when we talk about this. Uh, there are features in the platform that make sense for Java applications. Uh, there, there are things that Java applications could never do without. And for us, we kind of pick and choose what makes sense to bring over to .NET and to Windows. So one of the things that we decided made sense last year was CFSSH, right? It's really helpful to be able to remote debug your applications, and so CFSSH enables that. Of course, there are other features that we might want to bring and other features that don't make sense to bring to Windows. But some of the future features that we are thinking about are dynamic egress, route integrity, and Istio. Right. So uh, we've been working on making the HWC build pack better um, with multi-build pack support. So that has been around for some time with the other build packs, and we just enabled it um, a couple weeks ago. So what does that mean? That means as an application developer, you can now have an extension build pack that will supply dependencies or application performance monitoring tools or debugging tools to your app uh, without have to without having to copy that into your source code. Um, so just to illustrate what that looks like, uh, you can now CF push, provide a path to your extension build pack along with HWC build pack. Those will compose together. Um, they will both run in the staging, com staging container and finally be packaged up in the droplet. Uh, we are iterating on this. Uh, we're currently working to provide some more documentation and guidance to build pack developers on how they can write their extension build packs. Um, we're also welcome any feedback that you might have on how we can kind of make improvements to, um, to the build pack itself to better suit the needs of .NET developers. Also in HWC, we enabled HTTP compression. Um, this is for both dynamic and static content. Uh, it's turned on by default. Uh, we have sensible defaults for each. Um, this is just illustrating that now, you know, with HWC Build Pack, when you hit your app, your content will come back compressed. So moving on to the future platform features that we're looking at. Uh, graceful shutdown. This is a, a popular one. Um, so Windows apps running in Cloud Foundry have always been killed, which is too bad because uh, apps don't get a chance to run any sort of cleanup code. Um, this is uh, different from the Linux experience where you get 10 seconds uh, to clean up your app before it gets totally shut down. Um, however, we are looking into ways where we can make this um, possible in Windows Server 18.03 and above. Um, We've tried a couple different approaches to this. Uh, the one that we're most favored right now is um, application processes running in Windows Server containers do receive this control shutdown event when the containers are destroyed. Um, we are 
trying to understand how we can bring this or make this available to application developers in Cloud Foundry. And as of, as of Windows Server 19, 2019, we expect that uh, the amount of time that apps have to handle this event will be higher. So that's why this is preferred for us. Um, Great. So one of the things that we talked about previously uh, was bringing ContainerD to Windows. Uh, so there, there is currently only ContainerD support for Linux. Uh, we were hoping that maybe there would be a Wink runtime for ContainerD. But uh, this time, we've currently paused that effort. Uh, Microsoft has been working on bringing ContainerD support to Windows. And so there's a little bit of duplication of effort there. Uh, we're going to wait to see that happen. Uh, they also, in the meantime, introduced a library called Run HCS. It's actually very similar to WinC. However, we can't uh, get rid of WinC at this time. Uh, it doesn't have all the APIs that we need. So it's a thing we're keeping an eye on for the future. Uh, but at this point, we're still maintaining WinC. Uh, we're not yet using ContainerD. Uh, in terms of volume services, another thing that we hear uh, quite, quite a few requests for. Uh, due to operating system limitations, Windows Server containers cannot mount SMB shares by themselves. Uh, but there is a workaround. Uh, the good news is that inside a container, an application can access a file server, so long as you have the appropriate application security group set up. And so we've come up with a, a solution for uh, Cloud Foundry users with .NET apps can use a C Sharp library that will actually talk directly to the file server. And so usually, if you need to talk to a file server, you can achieve that uh, by using a Sharp SIFS library. And you can expose all those credentials to your app uh, using a custom user provided service. Natalie, talk about networking. Sure. All right, so hopefully you had a chance to check out Amelia and Christian talking yesterday about dynamic egress, but um, just in case you didn't, um, dynamic egress will let operators specify net out policy and have that be applied dynamically without having to restart your app. Um, this is a contrast to application security groups uh, that today do require an app restart uh, to take effect. So this, um, makes use of the VXLAN policy agent from Silk, uh, which we actually, we don't use Silk on Windows. So we are currently working to extract that piece of functionality, have it run on its own on a Windows cell, and we're working closely with the CF networking team um, to see how we can get this all working on Windows. Oh, uh, sorry, one thing to point out just on um, dynamic egress is that it does require Windows Server version 1803 or higher uh, because of the way we're specifying uh, the network policy. So more on networking. Um, earlier this year, we explored container to container networking uh, using Silk, uh, which involves setting up an overlay network and then configuring policy to allow apps on that network to talk to each other. Um, we learned a lot about the Windows kernel in the process, and we had high hopes, um, but they were dashed because, unfortunately, we don't think the Silk model will work on Windows. Um, so just to illustrate that in a little bit more detail, we have two cells here in CF. Um, each of those cells has its own subnet on the overlay, and we have two apps that want to be able to communicate with each other uh, east-west without going out through the Go router. Um, so it turns out that setting up an overlay network is hard on Windows. Um, there are some serious performance considerations that we're going to have to take into account if we decide um, to go with this approach. Um, but actually, the network uh, policy enforcement piece is, um, we think, is in impossible uh, using the Silk model. So just seeing a, a network packet that originates from app A is distance for app B. Um, with Silk, we would be inspecting, sorry, we'd be modifying that packet as it leaves the cell to have a tag in the GBP header field. And then when it arrives at its destination, we'd want to inspect that, um, inspect that header and see, like, based on the contents of this, of this field, is this traffic allowed? Um, unfortunately, on Windows, we don't have a way to modify or inspect that, uh, that header, so we think that we're out of luck. Uh, in that area. So more networking stuff. 
All right. Uh, so hopefully you caught uh, Shannon's talk yesterday. He talked a lot about uh, Istio. But here is a quick primer. So instead of implementing Silk, we, we thought, well, could we just leverage Istio? Well, why would we think that? Uh, in an Istio model, we could uh, rely on an Envoy running in a sidecar uh, container to proxy all the application traffic out to some sort of shared router that lives in, uh, in the infrastructure. And that shared router would have access to, say, an overlay network for Windows cells and an overlay network for Linux cells, not necessarily the same overlay network. And so leveraging Istio, an application has no idea that it's not on the same network. And it doesn't matter, because it can still communicate with everything that it needs to. Right? Uh, this is very theoretical. It's, a, it's an idea that we have. But we're thinking about all these other things that we could do instead of delivering a unified container network. Why do we want to use Istio? Well, there are a lot of benefits. Uh, so Natalie mentioned uh, a whole bunch of challenges in implementing Silk on Windows. And instead of relying on that, uh, that tag that we can't get to on Windows, we could offload policy enforcement to Envoy. All we'd need is some form of container overlay network. And we already know we can connect containers to each other in some way, just maybe not using Silk. We actually proved out Istio on Windows using a, a proof of concept, uh, an Nginx proxy, and, uh, and a .NET application. But setting some magic registry keys, we were able to force all .NET application out through an Nginx proxy. Uh, that could approximate working with Istio. So very early stages, but we're pretty excited about the, uh, the prospect here. Now, Istio requires Envoy. And there's a, there's a problem there. Uh, Envoy does not currently support Windows. However, we've been working to get Windows support merged upstream. Uh, Microsoft initially began porting Envoy to Windows back in 2017, around this time. And since then, we've managed to get uh, Bazel, the build system for Envoy, uh, merged with Windows support into the upstream repo. We also have a whole bunch of PRs coming to make everything actually work on Windows. Here's a little teaser. Uh, we've got a concourse CI running a subset of the Envoy tests. And so you can actually go and check that out. You can't see the URL there, uh, but it'll be in the, in the slides. So you can follow along at home. So with Envoy, we think we can enable uh, route integrity, which has been around for quite some time now in Diego as an experimental feature. Um, this, of course, leverages Envoy for um, router validation of the app instance identity. And just to illustrate that right here, the Go router is using mutual TLS with the Envoy proxy to verify that the app request is going to the app instance that it was destined for. Um, and we are going to uh, demo Envoy running on Windows in a bit. So this solves um, another one of our problems that we encountered earlier this year, which is that IPsec does not currently work with Windows Server containers. This is due to um, a, a limitation of the operating system. Um, but route integrity provides us a way, an alternative way that we could secure traffic um, inside Cloud Foundry. And um, Diego recently, uh, maybe you saw the email to CFDev, uh, they will introduce a feature to tunnel all traffic in, um, including SSH through Envoy. So this would be um, a way for us to make sure that traffic inside of CF is totally secure. And now we're going to demo. All right. See how this goes. Live demos always go seamlessly. So I can't see that. Great. So I'm going to uh, SSH into an instance of an application I have deployed to a Windows cell. Uh, so I'm going to CF SSH to Nora. And I'm going to forward a port. It's 61.003. So here we go. Uh, I think I'm still on the Wi-Fi. Whew, OK. 
now. There we go. So here is uh, that Envoy running on Windows on Cloud Foundry. So pretty excited about this. Uh, if I show you what's happening here, uh, we have dynamic certificate uh, rotation loading up here. So you can see these are actually the instance identity credentials that are being presented to our Windows container, just like on Linux, being dynamically loaded in here into the Envoy proxy. Uh, surprisingly, works pretty well. And I can see if I look at my listeners, uh, we have two listeners here. So Natalie mentioned that all traffic can be forwarded through the Envoy. So the two listeners, one of them, 61001, that's actually mapped to port 8080 inside of my container. And port 61002 is mapped to port uh, 2222, which is the Diego SSH data. So uh, back over here inside my container, uh, if I look at the uh, process list, you see that, uh, oh, maybe make this a little bit bigger. There's no, uh, there's no Envoy process running inside this container. There we go. So you can see this is actually where my app is running. HWC is my, is my application. Uh, so where's that Envoy running? Well, let me just first show that the Envoy is, in fact, listening on this cell, right? Uh, up here is the 61001 and 61002 listening inside this container. OK, there's some magic happening. So let's get out of here. So I'm going to Bosch SSH to the Windows cell that this container is running on. Give it a second. Hopefully. Once again, launch a PowerShell. OK, let's look at all the uh, containers running on this cell. So this is my application container. And there's a second container here. It has a dash Envoy on it. Well, turns out we have sidecar containers on Windows. So this is pretty cool. Uh, in, uh, out here in Wink, I can Wink exec into that ooh, container. We have a little bit of a problem with uh, line wrapping and, uh, and the open SSH server from Microsoft. Uh, the the uh, CFSSH server has no problem with, uh, with line wrapping. Uh, so anyway, now I'm inside of this sidecar container. And I can take a look at that process list and look at that. There's my Envoy. So we have sidecar containers running an Envoy that we have managed to build uh, connected to that, that main container and proxying traffic uh, for Windows. So we are super excited about this. This is uh, something we've been working on for the last uh, three months or so. And uh, it's taken a lot of effort both inside and outside of Pivotal. And we can't wait to see it. Finished. All right, Natalie. All right, so uh, that's our talk. Pivotal is hiring. Come work with us. Uh, we love pull requests, so please check out uh, Wink Guardian on GitHub. Uh, we're in CF deployment. Use the Windows cell ops file and find us in Slack. We're always here to answer your questions. That's it. So any questions to Natalie and Matthew? So, thanks a lot, Matthew and Natalie. Um, I have just a question about route integrity. Uh, in our current foundations, we have enabled this feature for our Windows cells, and this also changes the way the Go routers work, because they now depend on this. They, they do not have a timeout anymore to delete unused routes from their table. How is, uh, does this now contradict to Windows, where this is currently, as I understand it, not working? Yeah, so, so the route integrity, uh, 
implementation on Windows is like very, very experimental. Uh, however, it uses the same code path as, uh, as on Linux. So uh, essentially what, what happens is uh, the, the Go router initiates that mutual TLS connection to the container directly to that Envoy, right? And uh, instead of uh, doing a heartbeat every, I'm not sure if it's 60 seconds or something like that, uh, the Go router just knows about where all the applications should be and then uses mutual TLS to ensure that it's communicating with the instance that's on the other end, right? Now, we're, we're planning to introduce this as a very, very experimental feature just to start gathering uh, some feedback. Uh, you might not have seen it when I was uh, SSH'd into the Windows cell. The, the Envoy had used a significant amount of CPU. Uh, currently, it is not optimized at all. It is very much, very much an experimental feature. Uh, the point is, uh, we have currently route integrity enabled in our okay. foundations, so the system currently uh, relies on this feature, and uh, we even had a, had a problem when uh, we co configured on the other side, do not check for SSL consistency, and so we had often routes which were, were never deleted in our foundations, and this got us into a lot of trouble in the Linux world. Mm. Now we have enabled SSL checking and now everything works. And if uh, you know Windows does not support a route integrity with mutual TLS, then uh, yeah, we, we don't know. I, I understand that we might run into a problem here. Yeah, we, we, so should, we should dig into that a little bit more, uh, yeah. especially with some of the other subject matter experts in this area. Yeah, it's basically about mix and match Windows and Linux yeah. Diego cells in that environment. Right. Uh, around uh, loading SSL certificates into Windows containers, I know this is something that you all have, have uh, struggled with. Uh, we think we might have a fix for that uh, that we came up with over this trip. So stay tuned. Any more questions? Thank you very much to Natalie and Matthew.